May I ask, is that Crystal Garrett? Garrett, is that you on the perimeter campuses whose name I see? You have to answer in chat. But if that's you, I am very honored. All the professors, I am honored that y'all would get on. Wow. Yeah, I think that's Dr. Garrett from um, the Dunwoody campus. I think she may be in Dunwoody. Mm -hmm. Yep. Very good. Right. So we'll give people just a few more minutes to come in. Yep, you tell me you're running this. Okay. I do want to give everybody a caution. I'm in here with my uh, my dog, who uh, if if someone if the postman should come to the door, I have a sign up, but you never know. So I apologize if uh, if she starts barking, but she's being pretty good. And I see Robert. My um, the chat just came out. Dr. Denise Turner. I think she's at Dunwoody. She is not yes. only a friend and a colleague. She's one of my link sisters. So I am. Oh my gosh, Dr. Turner. That's a that's a phenomenal Atlanta family. Yeah, her parents changed the landscape of Atlanta. So, Dr. Turner, thank you for getting on. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we're we're up to about seventy, and I think that's going to be we may get a few more coming in. But why don't we go ahead and start? Um, so we'll just go ahead and start and. Um, I'm go, uh, my name's Robert Woodrum and I teach uh, history off of the Decatur campus at Perimeter College. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to just talk just briefly to introduce this event and uh, introduce Dr. Shannon. Um, and then Dr. Shannon is going to give a presentation and we're going to have some question and answers at the end as well. And so just really appreciate everybody for coming, for registering, for supporting events like this, because the, the more people who come, the more we can say, we need to do events that look at the African-American community. Uh, we get high turnout and um, so we're very excited. So, okay, um, so I just wanna welcome you. Um, and just to give a little background on the 19th Amendment, uh, the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution was finally ratified in 1920 and it prohibited states from using a person's sex as a qualification for voting. And the US was not really a leader in uh, in this respect, we were actually the 27th country to give women this right. Um, and it was the culmination of a really long struggle uh, going back almost a century um, to before the Civil War to the abolition movement, uh, where sort of you had the birth of the four, first women's rights movement, of which the suffrage right was one of the uh, key goals. Um, and then after the Civil War, you had during Reconstruction, the struggle over the 15th Amendment which did not uh, prohibit discrimination based on sex either. Um, and uh, the final push sort of came uh, in the early 1900s. There was a constant struggle, but the, the final push came in the early 1900s with uh, another wave of protests, arrests, and jailings. At one point uh, during World War I, women uh, chained themselves to the fence outside the White House. They were arrested and sentenced to seven months in prison for that. Um, when they went on hunger strikes to protest their treatment, they were force fed. And this generated a great deal of support for the women, but also for the cause. But perhaps more importantly, or at least equally as importantly, were the tens of thousands, thousands and thousands of women who during World War II went into the factories, into the shipyards, and did the jobs of men to help build the weapons that armed the soldiers that allowed the Allies to prevail. Um, and it was after that uh, effort that women earned the right. And today we're going to focus on this, but really focus on the issue of voting rights in African American women, because for African American women, it was sort of a mixed victory. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce our speaker today. We're so lucky to have Dr. Lisa Shannon, who teaches in the African American Studies Department at the downtown campus at Georgia State. Uh, Dr. Shannon was born in Tulsa and reared in Tampa, Florida, as we were talking about at the start. After attending the University of Southern California and the University of Florida, she earned three, three degrees from Georgia State, a BA in African American Studies, an MA in History, and a doctorate in History. Dr. Shannon is a His 
her story in, whose work focuses on community relations, grassroots activism, and Southern African American culture. Her forthcoming publication, Creating Community, A History of the East Washington Community in East Point, Georgia, explores the inception, the evolution, and the survival techniques of one of Georgia's most resilient African American communities. Uh, a mother of two uh, Georgia State University alumni, uh, Dr. Shannon believes that her mission is to teach. She has summed up her teaching philosophy this way, quote, the community that we serve is broad, very diverse, and non-discriminatory. It pleases me to see students grow academically, socially, and culturally. Dr. Shannon's talk today is titled, A Sankofa Moment, Reviewing a Century of the 19th Amendment. So I'm getting ready to turn all of this over to Dr. Shannon, but before I do, let me just say that we have scheduled some, as I mentioned, some question and answers uh, for the end. So if you have a question, if you will type it into the chat uh, or into the Q&A section, um, I will keep monitor this during the presentation and try to write down as many as I can. So we may not get to all of them, but we'll get to as many of them as we can, and we'll do our very best. So, okay, everyone, uh, please welcome me in welcoming Dr. Shannon. Dr. Shannon, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I um, It's an honor, it's a privilege. My service generally comes through teaching, so I'm just gonna share I teach, of course, so that I stay on track through a PowerPoint. So I'm going to open the PowerPoint right now, and we're going to start. Dr. Woodrum will stop me at 3:30 in case I get a lot of, in case I get long-winded, <laughs> but I shouldn't. All right. All right. Can everyone see that? Yep. If by some chance you can, great. All right, well, this is who I am. I am Lisa Renee Shannon. Um, of course, um, Dr. Woodrum just gave a great, um, great introduction for me. And this will be our agenda today. At first, I'm gonna do a libation. I'm gonna explain what that means in a moment. I'm gonna talk about an abstract, a purpose. I'm gonna go through what African-American women fought for and continue to fight for today. I'm gonna go, um, I'm going to speak about what African American and European American fought, how they fought for the 19th Amendment, which, of course, Dr. Woodrum said was effective August the 18th. And then I'm going to go to the slide a little bit and talk about grassroots activism when people choose not to use the political system but still get their social and society changes. Um, done, change effectively. And then, of course, we're going, we have to look at Fannie Lou Hamer, we have to look at SNCC, we have to look at CORE. I am going to end my talk talking about what is happening today with two phenomenal organizations. One is Fair Fight, and the other one is When We All Vote. Both of these organizations were conceptualized, started by African American women, and then by this time, it should be 3.30 and Dr. Woodrum will make sure that I've stopped so we can go into all of your questions and or comments. I did go ahead and, and tell um, Robert that if in between time, if he gets a question in the chat that he wants to stop me and ask me to just explain or just answer right then, I do not mind um, being stopped. I am one of those kind of professors who I like discussion. So it's very important for me to make certain that you're getting what I am hoping to teach and what I'm trying to translate. Hopefully most of y'all know what a libation is. In case you do not, a libation is an ancient African, we can say that it's African. Humanity, of course, as y'all know, starts in Africa, but it is definitely an ancient African ritual and what it does is it, it acknowledges right now during this time, you're hearing people say, say the name. You're seeing athletes wear shirts, say their name. That's what the libation does. It says the name of people who have transitioned, who either that they could be 80 years old, they still could be alive, but most transitioned to another world. And we say their name because we recognize we're only are because of the struggles that they endured. And so today we're talking about, of course, African-Americans' women plight 
with a 19th Amendment um, and the struggle that we still have today. So this slide is for me. I am going to honor African American women who struggle for us to get to where we are today. Most of these women you will see in my slideshow again, but I have to say their name. Now, when we do a libation, what you wanna do is you wanna get a plant or something that is alive. Most people do it in the ground. You'll see sometimes people go into cemeteries and you know they'll have, you may, you may just see someone who we may think is just a gang member or something, and they'll go around to the cemetery and they'll just pour even an alcoholic beverage or something. When I for my um, libation, I actually use water and I get something that, you know, that I love some of my real nice China. I get that out and you have to pour it into something alive because you're asking for their spirit to be recognized and for them to give you strength so that you can endure whatever you're getting ready to endure while you're remembering their presence. Now, when I give the libation at the end of it, I will say the person's name. I may say something about them, but then I will say Ashe. Ashe is basically the ancient, but the more correct form of saying, some people will say amen or amen. The reason Ashe in lieu of amen or amen, amen, amen was actually an Egyptian pharaoh. And one of the things that he made to do during that time, the Pharaoh was the ruler. He was the highest political ruler. And I say he, because most times it was a he. Sometimes there was a she. But this man, Amen, he made people say his name before they would speak to him. And then after they acknowledged him, just because of man's evolved, some people say Amen not actually understanding where that comes from, from, you know, from um from the Pharaoh Amen. So I say Ashe, and that's spelled A-S-E with a little tilde over the E. Some people will throw an H in there. So I give this libation. I first honor all of the ancestors whose bones are somewhere over in the motherland, over in, con in the continent, ancestors who built those magnificent relics that we look at, that we gaze upon, ancestors who created the word philosophy and created the calendar and our sense of time. I think about the ancestors whose names we know and some names we do not know. I think about those ancestors who are still over there in Alcabu land, the formal, the first name for Africa, and I say Ashe. And I pour this libation next for the ancestors who thought it not robbery to endure the Mayafa, the ones who went across those ships, some so much so that um, our, our ancestor, Amari Baraka, said if the bones, if all of the bones of the people who died, over 160 million people, not all of them made it, if their bones were just put into a railroad track, it would cover this earth nine times. I think about those ancestors whose bones are down at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, whose names we may never know. I think about them and I say, Ashe. This libation right here is for the ancestors who endured, who endured enslavement, who thought it not robbery to have their bones, bodies raped, all the atrocities, who thought it not robbery to still survive because they knew that one day that there would be ancestors who that they would have descendants who would be able to go to a school like Georgia State, the most diverse university in this country and get these degrees. This university didn't even allow people like me to attend until 1963. So I thank you for those ancestors who endured enslavement in this country and all of the horrifics, but chose to survive, not take their life so that I could be here today. I think of them and I say, Ashe. Now I give this libation here for Mariah Stewart, the first woman to actually speak Publicly, I say Ashe. I give this libation for Haley Quinn Brown, who endured, most people don't even know her name, but endured so many struggles just so that we can say, so that we can have the privilege to vote, I say Ashe. I pour this libation for Nanny Helen Barrows, who used her Christianity and her religion to uplift women who worked with the National Association of colored women to work with women, both European American and African American to endure the privilege to vote. I tell her, Ashe, I pour this libation right here 
for Mary Church Terrell, oh my goodness, who did so much for the NACW and for people of all ethnicities. I say Ashe. I pour this libation for, of course, Shirley Chisholm, the first woman, the first African-American woman to run from presidency in 1972, and the first African-American woman to actually be in Congress in 1968. So I honor Shirley Chisholm, and I say Ashe. I pour this libation for Ida Bell Wells Barnett, who went on her anti-lynching campaign, who sued the railroad so that they would have to integrate to Ida Bell um, Wells Barnett, who worked so profoundly with the um, women of, for the 19th Amendment and worked, of course, her name is not even listed, but she was one of the founders of the NAACP. So I say Ida Bell Wells Barnett and I say Ashe. And then for um, Ella Baker, Ella Josephine Baker, that phenomenal woman who created the concept of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, but couldn't even be the president because she was female. And she said, no, no problem. I'm going to go and I'm going to invite students to Shaw and I'm going to create something called SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. All of those students whose names, some of them we will highlight today, who went on to make sure that people knew that it was not even their only their duty to vote, but it was their obligation to vote. So I say in the name of Ella Baker Ashe, and then I think about Mary McLeod Bethune, oh my goodness, who came from South Carolina, who was orphaned at an early age, but thought it not robbery to go to Daytona and begin a school and then unite this school with the Cookman Institute from St. Augustine. And then she created a college and then she worked with three different presidents. So I give this libation in honor of Mary McLeod Bethune and I say Ashe. I give this libation for Gwendolyn Eiffel, one of my parents' friends, who was a political in the news consultant who left us too early, who got sick, but she left a legacy for other African-American women to follow, who said, you know, you can look like me, you can be of a darker hue and still make it and be one of the, one of the United States um, top journalists. You don't have to look a certain kind of way, but I'm going to be who I am. I'm going to wear my natural hair. I'm not going to wear makeup. It's going to lighten my complexion, but I'm going to be who I am, and I'm going to make it as a journalist in this country. So I pour this for Gwendolyn Ifield. I pour this libation in honor of Virginia Burns Hope. One of, she was originally from Chicago, went to Nashville, but then came to Atlanta and worked with her husband, John Hope, who was the first African-American president of Morehouse. He was the fifth president of Morehouse, but he was the first African-American president of Morehouse, which meant the first four presidents didn't look like him. But she, his wife said, you know, when I come to Atlanta, I'm gonna be a community uplifter. I'm gonna create Head Starts. I'm gonna create something called the Neighborhood Union. Why aren't African-American kids here in Atlanta going to high school? So it was her concept to create the first high school here in Atlanta, Booker Talaferro Washington High School in 1924. That came out of the brain of Virginia Hope. So Virginia Hope, Virginia Burns Hope, I tell you, Ashe, I pour this libation in honor of Fannie Lou Hamer. We will learn about her again soon, but in the 1960s, this sharecropper heard Kwame Torre, former name Stokely Colmichael, we heard him speak and these other students on these freedom rights who told her that it was her duty to vote. So she braved enough strength. I mean, she dodged bullets and she started so many programs to uplift humanity, not just African-American women. And then she actually went and applied to be a representative there in the state of Mississippi herself and garnered 33,000 votes. So for this, for Fannie Lou Hamer, I think of you and I tell you, Ashe, Queen Mother Oddly Moore, oh my goodness, Queen Mother Mo Oddly Moore, Queen Mother because she knew her African roots while she was living in New York, but she told the United States of America, how dare you? How dare you after World War I, after World War II, apologize 
to our Japanese American brothers and sisters, which they should have for putting them in concentration camps and give them reparations. And you haven't once apologized to my ancestors and what we have been inflicted upon for over 250 years. I apology. I want my reparations. And she went to the United Nations with this plea. Queen Mother, I remember you. I salute you. This libation is for you. I say Ashe. And last in the corner, to my professor, a Georgia State professor, Dr. Jacqueline Ann Rouse, who left us this year on May, who taught me so much of that. Jacqueline Ann Rouse, who, who wrote the book on Eugenia Burns Hope, who stayed at Georgia State, came from Morehouse in 1991 and wrote the very first class introduction to African American history in 1981. I give my final libation today to the memory, to my teacher, to my mentor, Dr. Jacqueline Ann Rouse. So this is my libation. I ask the ancestors, I cannot do a libation without apologizing to our indigenous American brothers and sisters whose land we all stole whose land we all live upon, who have never even been apologized for. Over 800 ethnicities of indigenous Americans from this country who have to fight, who we call them immigrants and we put their kids in cages. Shame on all of us. I give this last libation, this final libation to our indigenous Americans. I tell them, I apologize. We will get better as a country, as a nation. And I tell them, Ashe. That is my libation. At the end of a lot libation, your final is Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. Oh, and that's generally what we all would say together. All right, so that's my libation. Dr. Wood, um, Woodrum did a good job telling you who I am. Our abstract is important that African Americans have always had a presence in U.S. politics. Oftentimes, the, pres the political role was not determined by their, their mere presence, but by their voice. It's important to remember that although people couldn't vote who looked like me during enslavement, 90% of the laws that were created from when this country started in the 1600s, really the 1500s, up until now, most of the laws were created to keep people who look in check. So that's important to know just because you don't can't vote doesn't mean that you can't practice your human rights activity. So that's what this abstract is about. It talks African-American women work diligently with African-American men to secure the vote under the amendment, which gave the males the right to vote. African-American women work diligently for all women to secure the vote under the 19th amendment. However, with a few exceptions there, African-American women's suffrage rights were not enforced until the mid-1950s. The purpose, this session has been told that African-American women from 1829 to the mid-1950s in order to secure suffrage for purposely disenfranchised African-American, um, um, African-Americans and African-American and European-American women. It explores how they use their positions as orators, political actors to expose emphasis inflicted by a power structure that want to, want to, wants to maintain a white male hegemonic government, especially the legislative branch, the branch that writes the laws. Once the law is written, then the fourth, the, in, in, um, the, execu the executive branch, they're just going to come and execute the laws. They're going to come and enforce it. And the judges can only judge on what's been written. So the important to me is making sure that you're a part of this legislative branch. It primarily highlights the grassroots activism of a determined group of ladies who organized, galvanized, and changed the U.S. political landscape forever. This talk aims to create a conversation about how groups participate in the political arena, especially young students like you. 
My goal is to make certain that each of you know that the blood, sweat, tears, and lives, what it costs women to obtain suffrage, and more importantly, what we, including you, especially new generation of students, must continue to do to fight for and maintain this right. Politics. I define politics. I use the Oxford Dictionary. The activities associated with governance of a country or area, especially the debate or conflict among individuals or parties having and hoping to achieve power. That's the definition of politics that I'm using today for the political arena that we will begin to discuss. Now, I actually start, some of you hopefully have heard of Mrs. Mariah W. Stewart, formerly known. Her first name was Mariah Miller until she got uh, married. I use her because she um she is the first woman, not just African American, but the first woman to speak publicly. She was an orator. I like the fact because I have gone back in history and I researched the society that they used was actually called the African American. She was using this term back in the 1830s. This term was used. Now for her, I actually use, um, I love her quote. And with the them she's talking about is students, but I'm gonna actually take the time to read this quote up under her picture. And it says, you can have taught them in the rudiments of useful knowledge, and then you can have private teachers who will instruct them in the higher branches and their intelligence will become greater and their children will attain to higher advantages and their children still higher. And then, though we are dead, our works shall live. Mariah Stewart said this in 1832. And what she's, she's basically talking to women and she's saying, have your children and then teach them and make sure that they teach their children and on and on. And then she says, they'll be smarter and more intelligent than we will, can ever imagine. And then she says, our works will still live on through our teaching. And I say this because with African-American, sometimes we never know our name, never know what people did, but that's not important. What is important is that each generation gets better, does better. And so we're here right now, we can vote. I can teach. I'm certain that some of the students who are participating on this call are males who don't look like me. They're my European American brothers. Look at this right now, how far this country has come. There are a few things that I teach all of my students at Georgia State. The first thing is this country has a lot of problems. We all know that. We're all living them right now. But to me, with my doctorate in his story, right? I change it sometimes because of some of the sisters I learned from to her story. This is still the best country of all the countries I know. Where else can a woman who identifies as African-American, whose ancestors were in bondage, teach to European-American men? We have problems, but we can overchange these. The next thing I talk about is not only is this the best country, this right here to me, I love Atlanta. Why do I love Atlanta? Look at what Atlanta has done. Atlanta was, it is the capital of the South. So we're gonna look at a few things, you know, in during this um, talk today, what Atlanta did and how oppressed women were. And we're gonna look at these washerwomen and how they were so oppressed, but look at how Atlanta itself has it evolved. Atlanta has an African-American woman mayor, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottom, and she's not the first. She is the second African-American woman mayor. That is amazing what this country has done, all right? So my favorite country, I can't say my favorite city, but I love Atlanta, right? And then Georgia State, a university who did not integrate until 1963 however, was created in 1913. So what is that, 107 years old? But a university right now, which is not an HBCU, historically black college and university, 
but who graduates more people who look like me than any other university in the country. It doesn't get any better than that. I have the best job. I, work, I have the best job, work at the best school, live in the best city right now for African-Americans and in the best country because we have the power if we use our common sense, our civic duty, and if we exercise this right, we have the power to make effective change. So Mariah Stewart, the first woman, which is why I started in 1829 to speak publicly, knowing that her voice should be heard, must be heard, and she had things that she had to say. Hopefully now you've read part of her bio because it's important to know at the end, she was born in Connecticut, went through a lot of changes, but, um, but at the end of her life, she became the head housekeeper at Freedman's Hospital and Asylum. She actually took over the role that Sojourner Truth had. More importantly, Freedom's Hospital is right there on the campus of Howard University, right there in DC. So to me, all of this just kind of lines up. And then of course she founded a Sunday school. So this concept of religion is playing a crucial role in these women lives, in these women's lives. So that's that's why I began in 1829. All right, Seneca Falls. We can't talk about, of course, the 19th Amendment, even African American role. American women's role in it without talking about the very first conference where women came together and you're gonna see some men to, to exercise their rights. Seneca Falls, it was first called the Women's Rights Convention of 1848. We know it as Seneca Falls because of course, that's where it was actually held. It was started, the two mastermind women who thought of this, do this conference was of course, Elizabeth Caddy Stanton. And of course, um, we we have and my, my, um, um, my, I'm sorry, Robert, you're, your the picture is is messing up my there we go in Lucretia Mott and I because I want y'all hopefully y'all can see we all can read her quote too but I want to tell y'all what Elizabeth Canton say a lot of them when I get in students some of my students think that Susan B Anthony was there she was not there she did not come into onto the scene until 1851 but Elizabeth Caddy Stanton said we are assembled to protest against a form of government existing without the consent of the governed to declare our right to be free as man is free, to be represented in the government, which we are taxed to support, taxation without representation, that's something this country was founded upon, to have such disgraceful laws as to give man the power to chastise and imprison his wife, to take the wages which she earns, the property which she inherits, and in case of separation, the children of her love. So basically, in 1841, Elizabeth Caddy Stan, um, Caddy um, Staten is saying women had no rights. As a matter of fact, in this country, a white male could beat his wife with anything as long as whatever he beat her with wasn't any larger than his thumb, and it was legal. In this country, until the 19th, an African American woman could be killed, and nobody did anything about it. We're always been struggling. You know, struggling is not new to us. Now I have Frederick Douglass down here because he was actually the vice president there at Seneca Falls. He was there. People think that African-American women were there. African-American women were not invited to Seneca Falls. No, we, we were, professors were not invited there, which becomes important too. Frederick Douglass says, let those who want argument examine the ground upon which they base their claim, the right to vote. They will find that there is not one reason, not one consideration which they can urge in support of man's claim to vote, which was not equally support the right of women to vote. Now, Frederick Douglass is saying this in 1848 and he hadn't even gotten his um, voting privileges yet. So this becomes this Women's Right Convention, the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. It begins to kind of set the stage up until the 19th um, amendment, but, but we must remember that African-American women, if they were there, they weren't there to speak. They were there to actually serve and be someone's servant. All right, this becomes important too, because, okay, my screen just froze. Because we hear of, well, you know what? I'm going to stop 
And then I'm going to come back and see if that helps. But we also hear of um, Sojourner Truth. Well, you know, because some people think, well, Sojourner Truth was there. No, she was not there. She did not come on the scene. I'm going to have to come back and um, come because it's not allowing me to share for some reason. I mean, it's not allowing me to change my slide. So let me stop sharing, bring it back up. We all we all are familiar with technology um, by now. We all know what that means and what it does. But Sojourner Truth was not invited. Um, I'm not going to pull up that one. I'm going to pull up a new one. Let me pull it up over. The scene until here we go until 1851. She comes at the Ohio Women's Rights Convention. Another thing that was misunderstood about her that I want all of you scholars, because y'all are brilliant to know, Sojourner Truth never said, Ain't I a woman? Never said it. That was added in 1861. We were re oh, I have it on there by Frances Gage. She never said it. Sojourner Truth never lived in the South. So ain't wasn't even something that would be in her vernacular. Generally, people who say ain't at that time weren't, you know, lived in the South. So she never lived in the South. Another thing, Sojourner Truth, which a lot of people don't know, she actually spoke German. So let's read her writing. And just from this writing alone, this former enslaved person who gets her freedom just for, um, someone can't see the screen, let me let me put this up. Um, let me see. It's, it's coming across as a dark screen. OK, can you all see it now? Yes, can you see it now? OK, good. I can. Thanks for putting that in the chat. Good. Thank you. All right. So Sojourner Truth, who, like I said, spoke German. This is what she said at the Ohio's Women's Rights Convention in 1851. She says, you need not be afraid to give us our rights for fear. We will take too much. For we can't take more than our pinot will hold. The poor men seem to, to all in confusion and don't know what to do. Why, children, if you have women's rights, give it to her and you will feel better. You will have your own rights and they won't be and, and they won't be so much trouble. Literally, that's the journal roots words. So I, I need y'all, if you get nothing else from what I say today. Please know that she never said, ain't I a woman, a black woman, an African-American woman. I mean, you can look at us and know we're a woman. So to me, that's very belittling. And I make sure all of my scholars know that. All right. And, and they were speaking in Ohio, this um, women's convention, because Ohio was drafting a new state constitution. What we will learn pretty soon in 1920, um, some states already had the right for women to vote. It just wasn't a federal law. So Ohio was one of those states, Wyoming was actually the first. Um, Ohio was one of those states who actually had women voting before 1920, just like in other countries, Dr. Woodrum was saying, women you know, have had the, had the right to vote long before 1920. There have been women prime ministers, women you know, heads of states, you know, this country, even though we say we're a democracy, we're a republic, we still lag behind on quite a few um, on quite a few of arenas when it comes with women. But that's another lecture for another day. All right. The national um, Af European American sisters, they got the fighting, of course, as most anytime you get a bunch of people together, people are going to have their own views, their own ideology. It doesn't mean it's wrong. They're just different. So European American sisters, um, they got the fighting in 1969, well, before then. And in 1969, they created two separate European American suffrage groups. The first one is the National Women's Suffrage Association that we know as the NWSA. The second one is the American Women's Suffrage Association. We hear a little bit less about that. That's the AWSA. Both created in 1869, the NWSA, um, New York City, and it was created by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. What I want y'all to get from this, what you need to get from this, they did not support the 15th Amendment. We'll get to that the very next slide. They didn't support it. Um, what they did support was gender equality. They were caring, of course, about women, you know, and they were trying to pass an amendment. They were trying to pass 
the 19th Amendment. Of course, at that time, it couldn't have been 19th because at that time, you know, it probably would have been like the 12th or something because we hadn't gotten the other seven yet. We hadn't even gotten to the 13th. Well, we got to the 13th Amendment. So at that time, they're actually trying to pass an amendment that would give the women right to vote. Susan B. Anthony says, it was we, the people, not we, the white male citizens, nor yet we, the male citizens, but we, the whole people who formed you, the union, which was really good. They weren't saying that black men couldn't have it or men shouldn't. They're just saying we want it too. The AWSA created in Boston, it was created by Lucy Stone. I'm sure historians, historians have heard of her. Many haven't heard of her husband, Henry Brown Blackwell, who was working with her. Julia Ward Howe, a lot of people haven't heard of her. Mary Livermore, a phenomenal woman. Um, Henry Ward Beecher, most of us have heard of him. They supported the 15th Amendment. They, they focus solely on the vote. We're not looking about gender issues. We don't want any of that. What we're going to focus on is the vote, and we're going to want everyone to have the vote, including after all men at that time. And so Mary Livermore, she said, above the titles of wife and mother, which although dear, are transitory and accidental, there is the title human being, which precedes and outranks every other. I love that quote. Because these women are European American sisters, Mary Liver. Livermore, she's doing this concepts of human rights. Forget civil rights. Civil is just if you have a civilization and people agree to it. No, treat people fairly because they are human and they deserve it just because we're breathing right here. All right, so that becomes, once again, the screen is not, maybe I'm staying too long. Maybe that's it. All right, I'm going to have to stop sharing and come back again because this is just our technology today. But now we're getting to... We're going to look at the three amendments that, of course, every African-American, all of my students better know, any of my students better know these three amendments. They're the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th amendment. All right, can y'all see now? Are y'all, can y'all see now? Thumbs up? Okay, good. Yep. The 13th, the 14th, and the 15th amendment. Of course, the 13th amendment, everyone knows, the abolition of enslavement, except for the penal system. 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery, except for prisons. So if the 13th Amendment was ratified December 6, 1865, if you were in my class, I would ask you, okay, scholars, y'all are brilliant. Y'all are good. I'm glad you can see. Thank you for responding. Y'all are brilliant. Y'all are top notch. When did prisons start? And I will expect my students to say, 1865. Right? Because the penal system or enslavement is about labor. Who's going to do the labor that no one else wants to do? It's not about capitalism. It's not about, Ray, I don't like you because you look differently. It's about labor. That's what it, it's, slave itself is not even a, an African word. It comes from a Slavic region, the Baltic, present day, um, Lithuania, Latvia, and Lithuania. That's where literally the word originates from. So it had nothing to do Irish people, Latvians, Polish people, of course, um, Czechs, Budwis were all enslaved people. Czechoslovakia, Slovakia, slave. That's where it comes from. So the penal system, the 13th Amendment is important. Most of y'all saw 13, I hope. You know, if not, please go view the movie. Um, please go view it. But um, abolishment of enslavement, except for the penal system. 14th Amendment, all persons born in the U.S. are citizens. That's what some people tried to get, you know, President Obama on. It didn't make any sense. You know, some people don't know that Hawaii is actually a state. You know, that's geography, I guess. I'm not, I'm not really certain, you know, who was teaching that history history course. 15th Amendment. The right of vote, the right of citizens to vote shall not be denied because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. That is only for men. Prior to the 15th Amendment, American males could vote after 1676, another election. The 15th Amendment that was only for European American males. 15th Amendment, it says the right of citizens to vote didn't even have to really say male, but that's fine. It wasn't ratified until February the 3rd, 1870. 
is important to remember that those two organizations started in 1869. So they were working towards an amendment. They were just hoping that this 15th amendment would include them. All right, so then we have the Civil Rights Act of 1866. All persons born in the U.S. are citizens and are entitled to equal protection under the law. And then the Civil Rights Act of 1875. One of the things about the Civil Rights Act 100 years later of 1964 is basically the same as in 1866 or in 1875, but it's just in 1866 and 75, there was no enforcement of the law or the troops had to be removed. So that's what happened. Um, I'm gonna skip through these a little bit, but it's important to know during reconstruction after African-American males could vote, who was going into office, they were voting for people who they felt had their similar interests. So this, people, he, this picture here, I'm sure most of y'all have seen it by now. This is the first African-American senator sitting down there, Hiram Rebels, right there. He's from Mississippi. He's on, the, he's on the bottom to my left, to your right. And then there were the others were representatives. This was the 42nd, 41st and the 42nd Congress there at, you know, there at NBC. And one of the representatives is right from Georgia, who went all the way over to DC. So this is what's happening during Reconstruction. Between, during this Reconstruction era, there were 69, between 1867 and 1872, there are 69 African Americans who stayed in, a, who served in the Georgia's legislature. 69, right? So this is what, this is what people were doing. Yes, you know, you want to vote for someone who you hope has your interest at heart so that the laws that will be made will, you know, help you because you're being oppressed. So that's important to know, but no problem. I don't know what country we live in. Um, what ends up happening in 1868, African-Americans were expelled from the Georgia legislature. And then we have, most of y'all know this AME, Methodist Episcopal Bishop, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. Most of y'all know who he is, the power of the AME church. Oh my gosh. But then Bishop Turner does this speech and he comes and he says, I claim the rights of man. This becomes important to African-American women because one of the things that we're going to get into with the, like the NACW with the groups of women, African-American women are saying, okay, well, if I can get my men my counter, if he can get rights, then I'll, you know, I, I don't want to say submissive, but more of a grassroots style. It's, it's very important. I don't care if you know my name or not. I just want community uplift for people who look like me and then people who've been oppressed. Then we have what we call, you know, the fraud of the century, the compromise of 1877, which of course, there was a presidential deadlock. Oh my gosh. Florida comes up again, and of course y'all know this, it's the Hayes-Tilden decision from the president election of 1866. Hayes is the Republican, of course, Tilden is the Democrat, the, the Democrats who are primarily in here in the South, you know, some people, like if I was really teaching, I would say Dixiecrats, the Democrats actually um, said, you know what, we don't, you can have Washington, D.C. We don't like Lincoln, we don't like y'all anyway. The only thing we want y'all to do is remove the troops from the South. So you remove these troops from the South, where is the enforcement to make sure that these newly free people who've only been free now for about 10 years remain their liberation, the black schools that were started by the freedom schools and stuff, that you remain all of this. So of course the federal troops are removed in Atlanta, the federal troops were stationed right there where Booger T. Washington High School is today. That's where they were stationed, right there where the AU Center, oh my gosh, I love that area. The only area you can go to from pre-K all the way up to be a physician without leaving the area. I love the AUC, right? It's one of the reasons I love Atlanta. But the black men, the regiments who had guns right there, they were removed. And so of course we know what happened plan takes over, all of that begins to happen. So, you know, now we go into the nadir period. I want to talk now, I've been saying to y'all about this um, politics. I'm going to move, um, move away from the 19th Amendment because I want to talk about this one group of African-American women in Atlanta, these washerwomen who fought for their rights, who said, you know what, I'm not even going to worry about voting. 
Now, we see what happened. You've removed the troops. They're right there at the AU Center area. One of the things that they did, they remember that in Atlanta, keep in mind, the capital of the South, there was this big cotton exposition, the Atlanta State Fair, a huge thing, where the capital of the South, and then Atlanta's the capital of Georgia, so everyone was coming here for the State Fair, which of course becomes extremely important in 1895 with Booker T. Washington, right? And so these washerwomen, they went on strike because they were actually going into European Americans' homes, they were cleaning, they were laundress, they were laundry women, they were going into homes. So while they were in the homes, everything was happening. People weren't paying them, they were being raped. Anything that you could imagine was happening. So they just said, fine, we're gonna go on strike and we're gonna make you bring your laundry to us because we know that our European American sisters aren't gonna do their own laundry. So either you're gonna bring it to us or it's not gonna get done. And these women actually did that. They fought police. If, a, if an African-American woman decided she was going to break the fight, sometimes publicly, they up police and take out what they wanted. And this is the letter that they wrote to the mayor of Atlanta. It said, dear sir, we're the members of our society are determined to stand to our pledge and make extra charges for washing. And we have agreed and are willing to pay $25 or $50 for licenses as a protection. The um, Atlanta mayor made them pay money. Of course, there's always going to be some kind of taxation, some kind of poll tax. And so they said, fine, so we can control the washing for the city. We can afford to pay these licenses and we'll do it before we will be defeated. And then we will have full control of the city's washing at our own prices, as the city has control of our husband's work at their prices. Don't forget this. We hope to hear from your council to week or no washing. Yours respectfully. It was 408 you said, and this is just um, one of the pictures of them. It's important to know that they decided to go on strike right before this Atlanta World's Fair. So you come to a city, it's not gonna be clean. Oh my gosh, it's like the Olympics. Let's get a, a, rid of our homeless brothers and sisters before the Olympics come because we want Atlanta to look good, the city too busy to hate, right? So this is this kind of political activism that African-American women are engaged in, whether we vote or not. But now let's get back, of course, to the vote. This is some other pictures of the washerwomen. And this was their slogan, we're going to work for six days and rest. You know, they, of course, it came from Exodus. This, this concept of religion is going to just going to keep running through women. Now, this is something Dr. Ross, I mentioned her er, um, earlier, and she made me learn three nodes um, for 1895. One of them, Frederick Douglass dies. One of them, Dr. Um, du Bois earns his PhD from Harvard. But the other one is when Booger Talaferro Washington spoke at the Cotton Exposition um, here in Atlanta. As a lot of y'all know, he says we can be as um, separate as the fingers, but as joined as the hand. A lot of people who are uneducated and don't know what they're saying, they take that as he was an accommodationalist. No, up under that big coat, he carried a gun. He founded a university, Tuskegee University. Um, and, you know, you hear about the Klan marching a lot of places. I tell people, you don't hear about the Klan marching at Tuskegee, right? Because Booker T. Washington was packing. He was meeting with presidents. He was supporting the military after the Spanish-American War. Some African-American brothers who were defending themselves and lost their military rights. So he was doing a lot in the community. I make certain that students notice, because then I ask them, okay, well, the first high school in almost every city, who was it named after? Who was it named after? And they have to say, oh, it's called Booker T. Washington. That's because of what he was doing behind the scenes. So I don't care what you call me. You're not going to call me broke. And you're not going to call me a community person. He believed in community uplift. 1895 becomes important because we know 1896, what happens? Plessy versus Ferguson. Oh, separate but equal. Comes out of Booger T. Washington, someone translated what he said about me being as separate as the fingers, but as joined as the hands, and we are the blacks and whites, because we got to get along. If you keep killing us, we're going to keep fighting back, and there's not going to be a country that we're going to have to worry about anyway. So that's what he was meaning. But of course, you know, some nice politicians, judges, took it to mean, oh, let's do this Plessy versus Ferguson and do separate but equal. Still fighting that in 2020. But another thing that occurs in 1896, 
African-American women, they say, okay, you know what? We don't mind being separate, no problem. We're gonna fight for our rights, but we're gonna create our own organization. One of the main organizations that comes in 1896 during this time is the National Association of Colored Women. Oh my gosh. Their motto, lifting as we climb, right here are some of the, um, the two sisters who started it, the two women, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, Charlotte Fortin Grimke. It's important to know educated women, women who didn't care whether or not you know about their name, and women who were still working with their European American counterparts to vote, but it's just, we got to focus on our community and that's what the NACW did, right? So this is 1896 too. Their first, well, I'm, yeah, their first president is Mary Church Terrell. This woman is amazing. We have a lot of say in 1898, she was the speaker for the NWSA. So that's this right here proves that, you know, African-American women were working with European-American women to garnish this, you know, the right to vote. What becomes important with Mary Church Terrell, what gets her to acting is one of her friends, Thomas Moss, some of you may have heard that name, was lynched in Memphis. He was also the friend of Ida B. Wells. Right? So that's what sets both of them off into their activism. Mary Church, Church Terrell, she actually, if any of you on the phone are members of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, she is the one who wrote your prayer, the prayer for the sorority. I like mentioning that as well. And of course, here's Ida B. Wells. She is working, of course, for suffrage. She creates the first African-American club solely created for the right to vote. It's in Chicago and it's called the Alpha. Alpha, of course, y'all know what that means, the first Alpha Suffrage Club of Chicago. She creates this in 1913. And of course, this is after her friends were, um, her friends were lynched. I love this quote by her. Um, a Winchester rifle should have a place in honor in every black home, and it should be used for that protection which the law refuses to give your Second Amendment right, right? I think Doc, Dr. Woodrum told y'all I'm from Tulsa. We know what happened in Tulsa in 1921. The Gap Band, Greenwood, Archer, and Pine, those that street where they all three of those streets merged together, that corner, that's where the bomb was dropped. Gap Band, you dropped the bomb on me, but you turned me on, made us mad. Charlie Wilson, the founder of the Gap Band, he's from Tulsa too. I practice my second amendment right. That's not for everybody, but that's Ida B. Wells because she said when the government, the government's role is to protect and to serve. When the government fails to do that for its citizens, the citizens, it is your duty to do it for yourself. It is also important to know that Ida B. Wells, she was actually, a, she ran Republican for a seat there while she was in Chicago and she was there at the Republican National Convention. All right, and this is the, the headquarters there. I have to kind of go my time. The 19th Amendment timeline, of course, we did um, Sen um, um, Seneca Falls. One of the things that we did, um, one of the things I want y'all to know that in 1866, Elizabeth Caddy Stanton, who was there at Seneca Falls, 66. That's important to know. So this European American woman, she was like, not only do I not have the right to vote, but I'm gonna run for presidency and she garnered some votes. So that becomes important. And of course, um, up, going up into the 19th Amendment, one of the things that really helps to secure it um, is after World War I, women were women had become wage earners women you know had to leave the homes to make certain that the homes you know kept, um, that the jobs kept going when men were off to war and they're like if we can be wage earners if we can go out and work in these factories using their their um their their um their i guess their tools like dr woodrow was saying women started getting chained there at the white house they started using the media they started embarrassing the United States, you know, that was supposed to be this land of democracy. This is the um, Jeanette Rankin from Wyoming. She is the first woman to actually hold an office there in Washington, D.C., a phenomenal woman who worked with African-Americans, 
Um, her brother is helping her there in Wyoming. Wyoming become, becomes important. Um, there are some other people in Wyoming. Um, I don't want to mention, but you're welcome. I, I would have my students watch the movie Vice for extra credit. Robert, I think I'm one minute over. Let me get this. Mary McLeod Bethune, of course, I have to, um, you know, hopefully we know her, but she's also, she, um, she, she starts the National Council for Negro Women, which begins to, of course, really take off. Dorothy Hyde is her mentor, and she is the African-American woman who works with three presidents. She works with um, Coolidge, Hoover, and, of course, FDR. She becomes a lifelong friend, of course, of Eleanor Roosevelt. Her last will and testament is a document that will make everyone cry. So hopefully, you know, some of y'all, hopefully you'll take the time to read that. There's a perpetual, perpetual human rights um, struggle. And of course, most of with the system. I do have to put Dr. Doris, the third person here on my left, your, your right is Dr. Doris Derby. She is a Georgia State former professor and also she started the office of african-american students helps um, i forget the formal title of it but she was the photographer during the student movement that was her role she was there with snick but a phenomenal woman in her own right of course i have to always put ruby doris smith robinson a spellmanite who was working with students and of course diane nash of course the student who set off the sit-ins there in nashville but the one thing i want to make sure that um y'all know I, I wanted to put mrs mamie teal um on here as well she is emmett till's mother and we know, um, you know, of course, that open casket image. But it's important for y'all to know too about Shirley Chisholm. I think I um I said that earlier. But here's when we get to Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, I don't want to go quick, um, quicker. But Fannie Lou Hamer. I'll end with her. I'll speak about her right now. Fannie Lou Hamer is the Mississippian former sharecropper who actually she um she comes against the senator. She lives on, her family has lived on the land of Senator John Eastland. He owns over 5,000 land um, um, acres, this fertile land where children are actually dying of starvation. And so Fannie Lou Hamer hears from these students, these freedom writers that I have, she didn't even know she had the right to vote until 1960. And so she comes and she, the students go down, they tell her she should vote. She becomes the secretary for the SNCC organization, right? She's from in um, in Mississippi, and she goes in the 1964 Democratic National Convention that is held in Atlantic City. She gives this speech. It's an eight minute speech. So hopefully one day y'all can hear that. I end this on what's going on now. First Lady Michelle Obama. She creates this organization called When We All Vote. Of course, on this, she has Tom Hanks, is, Tom Hanks is with her and these other phenomenal athletes, actors, people who are using their platform for the rights of all people. And then also right here in Atlanta, we have Fair Fight. So this phenomenal lady, I'm sure we all know her now, Stacey Abrams, who runs for governor, she creates this fair fight because of what's happening, what happened with the um, disenfranchisement again of people having their right to vote just two years ago and even systematically today. What politicians are doing to make sure that people are bamboozled not to think that their vote matters, which is absolutely crazy. If it didn't matter, why did you try to keep it from people for so long, especially women? And then all of the tricks that are that you know politicians starting in DC are using. So that becomes important now, these two organizations. And then I end this, of course, this is Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, but this is my um, I have to end with this. My students are always so excited that I know who this phenomenal artist was. And he says, Look at where I started, look at where I'm standing. You say it's luck but I know it's planning. And that was the phenomenal Nipsey Hussle who said nothing just happens by happenstance. It's because people organize, people plan, people use their platform, use their citizenship, and they make upward mobility for all of us. That is it. Robert, I am sorry. I went, I think, five minutes over, but that's it. What questions do we have? No, just thank you so much. Uh, I, the, the, those in attendance can't clap, so I'm going to clap as best I can. 
But I just want to say uh, uh, I got a couple of questions about recording. I am recording this, so uh, I, I, I'm going to download it however you can. And if you're a student, if you could email me on your GSU email account, please do it on that. Um, I can either direct you to where it will be stored or perhaps send you a copy of it or something, or uh, you can maybe have your professors contact me as well. That will be just fine. But I am recording this, but I'm a novice at all of this, so we'll see if it actually, uh, if I can actually make it work. Um, but we had a couple of questions, and I just, um, some of them were about slavery and some were about uh, um, some of the early uh, events. And I'm just wondering if, if I, there's a kind of common theme, and maybe I can ask this question to start it off. Um, at what point in all of these struggles for the for the franchise do you see a kind of solidarity amongst white and black women? And at what time do you not see it? Wh where do you see it historically breaking down, uh, do you think? Um, well, one of the reasons uh, breaking down is because I want students to know that when you come into any organization, there's going to be different thoughts. There's going to be different thoughts. So it's important to know that just because we don't agree, that doesn't mean that we have to, to break down. And that's generally the question that I get from most of my students. You know, Dr. Shannon, I don't understand why the white women and black women couldn't get along. And I say, well, you know, white women couldn't get along. The black women couldn't get along, which is why there's so many different organizations, sororities, fraternities. People can't. I argue that they never really totally dissolved, which is why it's important for me to say that Mary Church Terrell was still working with them. When they went to actually um, to March, when the vote was on Garner, Black women, Elizabeth Stanton, you know, she had a little issues, you know, but she told some of the women, including Ida, um, um, Ida B. Wells Barnett, that you have to march in the back of the line. So the black woman just went on. The, you don't tell a black woman she don't go in the back of nothing. And so she, they literally just filled in right there in the front and said, oops, didn't hear that. So it's important to know, like, if you pull up some of those marches, you will see African-American women in there, too. There were small disgruntles, because keep in mind, too, during the time, during the time, this concept of segregation, you have Southerners. You know, we're still in the South. You know, Atlanta's more segregated now than it ever was. I'll argue that in a minute. You know, but, you know, people still had their own biases. That doesn't mean that the platform, everyone who's who votes the way we fuss on a lot of issues. Oh, my gosh. But at the same time, we still have to choose how to pick and choose our battles and then who's the best candidate. So I think that, you know, even though they were fussing on um, different strategies, I don't ever think there was a tension. I, I, I mean, there was a completely um, this um, disassociation between them. I would argue that there actually wasn't. That's what Ellen Roosevelt, and also with Dorothy Hyde. They're still working together for women's rights, which will end up turning into um, Title IX, which will end up turning into Roe v. Wade, which will end up turning into the Welfare Rights Association, you know, so so to me, you know, we, we have to make sure we know that people are still working together. Well, we had some questions. I had a question about Sojourner Truth about, um, you know, when she actually got involved with the women's rights movement, what, uh, was she at Seneca Falls in 1851? But um, maybe you could mention that. But also, I'm just sort of interested in a broader sense you mentioned a lot of really interesting things about Sojourner Truth, that she knew German, that, and then also Mariah Stewart, who I've sort of become very interested in as a scholar, but I can find very little about her. About I got to do is Google, there's some great, if you pull up Mariah, um, Mariah W. Stewart and pull up David Walker's appeal. Mo Mariah Stewart was good friends with David Walker, who wrote that appeal to the black, to the to the citizens of the United mm -hmm. States, especially and particularly those in you know in, to the colored folks of the world. I'm sorry. In 1829, she's in Boston with David Walker. Her husband and he are best friends, which is what sets her off when he just miraculously died. 
-hmm. he was killed, but it was tuberculosis. It was uh, it was poison, basically. The autopsy says tuberculosis, but he was killed because of his, you know, because of his appeal. Well, that's what that becomes her spark. So if you pull up Mariah Stewart mm -hmm. and you can pull her up as an exhorter because her speeches are everywhere. I will say this because so many people have access to um, to Google and to, you know, to the Internet. Now, there are a lot of pictures of Mariah Stewart. That's not really her It's actually I saw Mary Chad Carey for a under that was Mariah Stewart. I'm like, I was so upset, you know, just doing some of my research. So there's a lot of inaccuracy. But if you pull her up, Black Pass, um, yeah, the Black Pass is a phenomenal website. Mm -hmm. Also, the history, the history organization, it's a really good. Um, and I actually, um, Robert, well, we now replay back. If you notice up under every slide, you know, I, I'm a historian. I have my doctorate. There. I pull, um, I actually put the citation up under each slide. Mm -hmm. So the citation will tell you where I got it from when you go back and revisit this. So that that will help you. But yeah, and then I also want to say, so Journal Truth was not was not at um, Seneca Falls in 1848. She was at the Ohio Women's Convention in 1851. Is where she makes this speech. Oh. If she if she wasn't at Seneca Falls, she was not there to speak. She was there to serve to help, right? But she was not there, and she did not speak. Let me put it that way at Seneca Falls. The only black person who spoke at Seneca Falls was Frederick Douglass. And that's another lecture in itself. Why he was allowed to, and I put allowed. Hmm. Well, I think that is all the questions that we have. Does anybody have uh, any other questions uh, for Dr. Shannon? Anyone have something you want to type into the chat real quick? Um, I, a lot of comments saying, uh, I need to take your class, Dr. Shannon. So you may be getting some students in the next couple of years uh, as people percolate down into the downtown campus from our campus and from the other uh, uh, George, uh, George Perimeter College campuses. Um, let's see, there's one, one thing I would ask, uh, maybe we could, we could conclude with this. Um, so 1920 happens, women get the right to vote, white women. Uh, but some black women are voting, correct, mm -hmm. in the North, those who have gotten out of the South. And can you address that a little bit? That is something that I fascinates even, me. I will even, Dr. Woodrum, some black women are voting before the 19th Amendment. It's depending upon your state. And remember this country, if you are a landowner. So there are some black women voting in the because they mm -hmm. own land. As a matter of fact, here in the state of Georgia, there is, oh my gosh, she's a Georgia State, um, um, oh my gosh, Kent, Leslie Kent. It may be Kent Leslie, but I'm almost positive it's Leslie Kent. She was at Georgia State's main campus, of course, before we had all the other campuses, including y'all now. And um, she wrote this book, Amanda Davis, a phenomenal work. The richest African-American woman, of course, her father was a planter, but the richest African-American woman in the state of Georgia. She, and of course, you know, and he left her, he left his enslaved child, all of his inheritance right there in Savannah, McIntosh County. So that became a big problem. Well, because she was a landowner, then she sued for her right to vote. Because remember the 15th Amendment doesn't say males. That was something that was in five. So if you go to courts and if you win, then so there, there were, the book that I use to teach most of my courses, um, I use the Odyssey mm -hmm. by Heinz and Heinz. And the Odyssey actually in voices, it names about four African-American women who actually sued the government. I think Maggie, Maggie Walker was one of them. She's the first actually, she's a banker and she's a millionaire. She's one of the ones who actually sues and wins. And so she votes. So there are some cases. That's amazing. Um, well, now we have a couple of questions. Can you stick around for just a couple more questions? <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. um, this is from uh, Dr. Turner here, uh, Denise Turner. Uh, what is the relationship between white women and black women today? And is there a unity between women in 2020? And why do you think uh, it's so or why not? Why or why not? I give this documentary and um, thank you, Dr. Turner. Um, and it's called, it's, the, it's on, it's called America's War on Poverty. 
You can probably pull it up. If not, you know, um, Denise, I'll send it to you. But it talks about welfare rights, and it starts in 1968. And um, it's the National Welfare Rights um, Association, right? And so the N NWR, actually organization, NWRO, and it's Black women and it's white women working together. Um, and they're working together because Donnie Tillman is the one who's saying, well, women's issue. If we look today, there is still, you know, Georgia, state of Georgia has 159 um, counties, of course. There are more European Americans on welfare than there are African Americans. But African American women and white women were working together to secure better welfare rights for women who, for whatever reason, are by themselves, and women are the ones raising this kid, these kids. Something, and this is, of course, is during the Johnson and President Johnson's administration, right? Of course, right after Kennedy, right before Nixon. Something happens in 1970. Um, one of my mentors, Dr. Audrey Dunham, she's actually writing a book on it right now because she was one of the ones fighting with white women or you know, um, not fighting with them, they're um, together, they're on the same side to come against the government with, um, you know, against welfare, for welfare rights, to get more money, to get more privileges. Something happens in the early 70s where White women, it's almost the same thing with white men in 1676 after Bacon's Rebellion. <laughs> um, white men started getting more advantages um, and just separated. Sometimes, you know, when if you govern someone, I don't want to learn Robert, I just may take it. The split. Another split that happens is the media. If you notice on the media, there was this show when I was little called Hazel. I'm not sure if y'all remember Hazel. Hazel was a European American woman who was mm -hmm. a maid. Do you see white women as maids on TV anymore? The media itself with, that is controlled by a power structure, someone owns the media outlets, says, I don't want this to be seen anymore. Whatever we, the images that are shown become basically what happens. One of the things that's happening right now in this political climate with, you know, um, Black Lives Matter and all of this, people keep talking about, well, white people are dying by the hands of police too. Have you seen one? Maybe so, maybe so. But just show one image. So there was this split doctor that happened in the early 1970s. I can't give more about it because hopefully Dr. Dunham will be publishing her book. This is coming from a primary person because she was there. She's one of the people who created the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, the Boston chapter. And Phenomenal. She worked at Georgia State too. I mean, Georgia State's amazing. I've been able to meet these incredible people. But she's talking about this split where certain people were given privileges and other people weren't. So yeah, it is it's, it, we talk about systematic racism, which people say, oh, it doesn't exist. Oh, it's a system. Oh, yeah, it does. <laughs> it, it really, yeah, it does. It's a system and who controls the system is a power structure. The 1%, right? So hopefully that helped Dr. Turner. Um, and I can yeah. send you on the, one of my classes, I show these documentaries where you see people walking together and marching together, but very seldomly do you see that now. It doesn't mean that we're not working together, but you may not see it as publicly as, as you know, we used to. So I have one more question from the chat and then maybe uh, a few more from the question and answer. So if you could stick around for just a little bit longer, let me let, let me get to this one on the chat. That's interesting. Uh, going back to Seneca Falls, uh, would it, would it, and this is from Professor Charles Boyd, who is uh, off of my campus. Would it have been uh, Stanton or other organizers or both who made the decision to exclude Black women from the Seneca Falls Convention? It's important to remember. <laughs> you know, you're talking 1848. And depending upon who's in the room determines who doesn't come in the room. So if you have Southerners in the room who do not want to see educated Black women, they're not going to be invited. 
So it's, it, that's very important to know. You're also talking about politics, where you're trying to work with 1848. Now, let's just keep in mind the national um, context. Cotton is king. The South is controlling 51% of the economy in 1848. You're trying to, you're not trying to piss off a sub. <laughs> right. It's 1848. So you're not going, you know, to me, and it's not justification, it's just common sense. You're not going to, because keep in mind how many educated African-American women you could have had there, including Sojourner Truth, right? I, I like telling people she spoke German, because people don't understand. Yeah, Frederick Douglass' second wife. So we have, you know, during this time, you have these people still mixing and congregating and working together to battle oppression. A Southerner who's representing 51 cents, 51% 51 of the U.S. economy, which is why the Southerners, why the South seceded and started their own nation called the Confederacy, because they had the money, and why they told President Lincoln, get your troops off of Sumter, because that's now our territory, Fort Sumter. And so that's where the first cannon was fired by Southerners, because that's the only place where there were still what's called Union or Northern troops. Elizabeth Cady Stanton is not trying to upset a Southerner who still had political power. This is also before the Compromise of 1850. California's coming in. This is this is before the Kansas Nebraska Act, where you're talking. Taxation, if, if the land is going to come in, will it be enslaved territory or will it be liberated territory? This concept of keeping this balance that creates, you know, the Civil War. So it's, it's, it's almost common sense to me as a his historian and a her historian why she wouldn't do it. Not in 1848, not in 1851. That's in Ohio as ratifying a new constitution. So you're trying to get a new constitution in 1851. That's a little different. I say New York because, of course, New York, of course, y'all know that y'all are scholars. His first name is New Amsterdam. But, you know, New York, a lot of enslavement is happening in New York. New York, Massachusetts, New York is what the, the those New England states have the first laws on enslavement. So just because, you know, it's supposed to be free area, it doesn't mean that you like people who look like me. Doesn't mean it, it doesn't mean it today. So it definitely didn't mean it in 1848. Mm. So hopefully that, that helped to answer some of your question. Hopefully. Definitely. Deb, I have a, here a, a question from a student uh, about Shirley Chisholm. Um, and it, the question is kind of a broad one. And, and it says, would I be able to learn more about Shirley Chisholm? I'm interested in learning more about her. Are there any videos or readings about her? There are a lot of um, videos. There are a lot of documentaries. I actually just watched one last week. On Now, I watched C-SPAN 3. I am a history, history nerd. But they have a phenomenal documentary on Shirley Chisholm. Please pull her up. Listen to what she said. She ran for office for president in 72. Jesse Jackson ran in 84. And she talks about how Jesse Jackson, she supported Jesse Jackson, but he didn't support her. She talked about how she got as the first African-American woman, how she got into Congress and then the, the, the committees that they wanted to put her on and how she had to fight so much. She was just like in the, in the mid 80s, she said, I'm not doing it anymore. She goes, I don't wanna die like Fannie Lou Hamer and just upset and always fighting. I just need some peace. So please pull up Shirley Chisholm. Oh my God, she's not even from originally from this country. You're going to love, oh, please pull up Shirley Chisholm. A phenomenal, phenomenal. And she just transitioned, I think, in 1990 something. I'm forgetting now, but she just transitioned recently. And were her parents, was, were they from the Caribbean? Is were they it's from somewhere, one of the Caribbean islands? Mm -hmm. And in her documentaries, and she's all so all you have to do is Google her and put video. YouTube has some, but um, you can tell when she's starting to get a little antsy, a little upset. You can hear that Caribbean <laughs> come out. Yes. I always love people from the islands. Just like me, when I get upset, you'll hear my Southern or you'll hear my Oklahoma. I saw it sounding just like my grandmother, you know, and you get a little passionate, as I like to say. But please, she, please go Shirley Chisholm. She has an autobiography, Unbridled and Unbossed. Is that what it's called? And um, I know I'm almost positive 
Um, what did she? It's no, it's called some. Oh, yeah, it, that may be. Oh, I'm forgetting her slogan. Um, that that, that actually may be it because it was her slogan was similar. I had it actually on my PowerPoint, mm -hmm. but you know, mm -hmm. um, but please just Google her. Once it comes, once she comes up, you'll love her. And she was right there at the 12th district of New York. And um, oh my gosh, she was she was in Congress from 68 until um until 80 something. You know, please, please pull up Shirley Chisholm. And I have another question here. I'm still on the uh, on the question uh, 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 site. Um, it says, I understand black women have come a very long way, uh, but I do feel that we face challenges. I'm sorry, but do you feel that we face challenges due to our gender? So are there still challenges? Of course, Barbara Smith, Melissa Bray, it's called all the women are white, all the blacks are males are men, but some of us are brave, of course. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not, but you can just look at um, who's teaching at Georgia State. Who's teaching at Georgia State? How, what's the representation? I, I, I love Georgia State, as I said, because he's graduating more students who look like me. But one of the things that I get, I've been teaching at Georgia State since the summer of 2009, every fall, spring, and summer. I still get in 2020, you're my first African-American woman professor in 2020 at Georgia State. So, um, gender. Shirley Chisholm said, and she used the word minority, but she's her, one of her quotes that I use, of my two minorities, she means black and woman. She said, I have been crucified more for being a woman than I ever have for being black. So, of course, but some of us are brave, which is why with us, we're grassroots. We know that it's not, it's not about us. It's about this next generation, leaving it better. I make sure that people know that both of my kids graduated from Georgia State. They have a fifth generation college degree. My, both of my parents have doctorates. My mom, I am fourth generation PhD. My daughter will be fifth generation PhD. If my son never goes back to school, I don't care. He, mom, I got one. I do this for you. <laughs> my daughter will go to school and get a doctorate, or she would better plan to leave this earth early. <laughs> and that's real because as a woman, you have to have different credentials just to get an invite to the table. Not to get a seat, just to get an invite. Oh, maybe, maybe I'll get hired. Just to get an invite. So I know that Dr. Garrett, Dr. Denise Turner, I mean, just to get an invite to the table, you better have that terminal degree. So yes, gender, I have, I have so many stories, me personally, about gender. My mom did, but we don't let the gender issue stop us. I'm a black woman with a PhD in a discipline called his story. I'll tell you this, I went to school and got $300,000 in scholarships and personal money. Didn't pay a dime. University of Southern California, University of Florida, Georgia State University. So I made my story work for me to get a terminal degree, a doctorate of philosophy in his story. No excuses. Gender is not an excuse. Color, not an excuse. Nothing is an excuse when you have right on your side. Because I knew it wasn't about me. I knew it was about giving my all to students, teaching their his history. Were blacks wrong? Yes. Were whites wrong? Yes. Shirley Chisholm said, did black men support me? Hell no. She said she got more white men to support her than black men. That's real too. But when right is on your side, you don't have to worry about any of that. So maybe this will be our final question, this next question. Um, yeah, and nice. I've, I've, <laughs> I so appreciate uh, Dr. Shannon, you sticking around and this is, but uh, uh, Anita Walker has been sending uh, me chats about, um, and she's uh, kind of uh, talking about uh, mental um, issues. She says this, she says, do you think it's a problem uh, do you think it, a, a big problem with progression within the ongoing progression of Black lives is mental devastation? Um, I, I smile 
And I'm sorry. I also, the director of the graduate studies department, beautiful. I, I love I love my job. I can't believe I get to do this. This coming, not, not this Friday, September the 21st, I'm over our majors and minors, and I get a lot of students. Um, um, my first session, I have four webinars that are done. We partner with Auburn Avenue. My first session is on mental health. Mm. It is done by the state director of, um, of health and human services for the state of Georgia. Her name is Dr. Terry Timberlake. She is giving this seminar Friday, September 25th. It starts at seven. Because it's a major minor session, it's a three part series. The first part is, is going to be me opening it up, you know, welcoming students to a new year, all the stuff you have to say to majors and minors, because it's mandated for African American studies uh, majors and minors. The next 30 minutes will be Dr. Terry Timberlake talking about different uh, mental health stresses, strategies, and organizations. It's imperative that Georgia State students know you can go and get free psychiatric counseling at Georgia State, 15 hours per semester. You don't have to pay a price for it. And it has to be kept private. These are licensed professionals. The that we have at Georgia State are amazing. Use the counseling center. You have, especially, I had a student just email me yesterday Mm. Shannon, I can't submit my assignment. I said, baby, you don't have to. There's something called an incomplete. Whenever you're ready to come back to class, you tell me. Because she didn't know her rights as a student. Your right as a student, no professor can fail you. You take care of whatever you have to take care of. If you have any issues, you contact me and I'll advocate with other professors who may say, I don't care. I don't, you know, whatever people may say, because that's real too. But for students knowing their rights during this season, after Dr. Terry comes, there's another phenomenal. Um, he has, of course, four degrees. He's going to go, of course, his name is Orlando Scott. He's the only chaplain, um, hospital chaplain, what's happening with COVID now in the hospitals at Gwinnett. But he's also an expert, 15 something years. At to come back on after Dr. Terry, and he's going to talk about the impact of social media posts to your career and to your health, because students don't realize some of the things that they're posting, how it can impact what Georgia State has. You have what's called a discipline report, and there are some things that people can pull up on you that if you have any kind of challenges, you don't want that social, and, and I tell people, I um, think about Stacey Abrams when she ran for governor. If you think this is a Spelman grad and a Yale Law School grad, what did she get attacked with? Her burning the state flag right here in Atlanta when she was a Spelman student, right? That's real. Mm -hmm. Does she have the right to do that? Yes, this country gives you the right to practice your first amendment. Of course she had the right, but that image. So mental health right? My psychiatrist every Friday, $300, write the check. I pay my tithes, send my money to my psychiatrist. <laughs> it is, and, and, and that's real. I am a black woman, I get tired. As you can see, I have, I, I teach 245 students. I have four classes. I'm trying to write. I'm a mother and a grandmother. I am single. I went through a divorce after 26 years. I go to a psychiatrist because I'm also a public person. I'm a professor at a state school. If anything gets out that I tell that therapist, then I'm going to take his license, everything. Right. Right. So, yeah. yes, mental health is so important. It's important for us as professors to make sure while we're giving. Last week, my students just had a, a, a I called it a week of reflection. I gave them no more. They didn't have anything on our module. I told them to go back, revisit, and just think for a minute. So many students, Dr. Shannon, thank you for this, because I knew it's week four now. Now we're getting acclimated. 
And I told this, you've never, because some of them I've had, you know, of course, you know, they're seniors, some are grad students now, so I've had them for a while. They thank me for that. So mm -hmm. as instructors, we have to make sure not only do we monitor our mental health, but we have to monitor our students. If a student hasn't shown up and they showed three assignments and now they're not showing up, I have one student who emails me every day. He didn't email the last two days. So I emailed him. Yeah, you get on my nerves. You email me every day about the sports course. But I'm just making sure you're okay because now I'm used to your emails. <laughs> yeah. And he just told me, he said, well, Dr. Shannon, I thought I was getting your nerves. I said, you are getting on my nerves. But I just need to make sure that you're mentally strong too. So I, I thank you for bringing that up. But please, and, and make sure students know their rights. Go get the, I can't get it. That's why I have to pay. They don't let professors get the free service. We're, we're employees, so we can't get it, which I think, you know, I need to uh, protest that. Well, these right. are so important. Well, um, Dr. Shannon, thank you so much. And I just want to read you one last comment from my, our, my colleague, who is also a GSU person, uh, Craig McPherson. And he says, you're sounding like Dr. Rouse now. And I know that would mean a lot to you because uh, I had Dr. Rouse as well. And she was also a mentor to me and so many other people. And I would just like to thank everybody for coming and thank you for your wonderful questions. And I'm sorry if I didn't get to all of your questions. Dr. Shannon, thank you so much for enlightening our students uh, with so many positive comments. And, and we look forward to seeing everybody in the future. Um, and thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shannon. Um, and uh, let's see, can, is there any chance you could email me the uh, PowerPoint and we will be in touch? I have to send it as a PDF because okay. it's um yeah it it it, it is still it, that's why I didn't send it before it um it still took about twenty minutes to um send I may maybe just forward I'll just forward you what I sent to my sisters. Okay. All right. Call me anytime, thank, Robert. Thank, thank you. Thank you bye so bye. much, Dr. Shannon. Thank, thanks, everybody.